advantage. One is the South China Sea. South China Sea conflict is highly likely. Confrontation is inevitable. Changing Chinese strategy makes the U.S.-China war highly likely. This is Blaine in 15. South China Sea may constitute a military front line in coming decades. Six countries lay claim to territory. China and the U.S. will determine this future front line will be a cold competition or hot competition. Beijing's strategy is shifting in response to a perceived threat posed by a U.S. pivot. The U.S. is increasing its military presence in the region and enhancing security cooperation with its allies, which also lay claim to territory in the South China Sea. This friction has the potential to draw in, the ch draw in China and the U.S. into a confrontation that neither wants. China commits the behavior of aggressively asserting its sovereignty rights in the South China Sea. Disputes in the South China Sea are stirring up substantial nationalistic fever. China's leaders may see internal political rewards for responding to these nationalist appeals, as well as benefit in using this nationalism for social control if other forms of legitimacy falter. The U.S. pivot has caused concern in China because of strong perception that the U.S. is enhancing its involvement to contain China. China is now pressing previously dormant claims on the South China Sea to protect its growing interests and gain control over its links to key sea lines of communication. And the conflict will start by miscalculation and escalate. This is Kim 16. There are a number of important factors that can trigger a future conflict. They include intensification of maritime disputes due to China's growing popular nationalism, the expansion of China's South China Sea claims, as well as its growing fleet of nuclear submarines armed with ballistic missiles, can be interpreted as part of this strategic effort to create what's known as a military parlance of bat as a bastion. The weak crisis management structure of the Chinese system and the lack of unity among China's large and complicated political, foreign affairs, and military bureaucracies could heighten the danger of escalation from an operational miscalculation at sea to a political and diplomatic crisis. Almost anything could be justified in the name of safeguarding China's security and maritime consciousness, even at the risk of deteriorating regional stability and causing foreign policy consequences. And great power war will result. This is Kim to 16. China's lack of transparency has made both its neighbors and the U.S. suspicious. A recent upsurge in tensions, partly due to Beijing's greater assertiveness, land reclamation, and energy explorations, have renewed concerns that the area is becoming a minefield with global consequences. This has complicated the issue, making the South China Sea a center for big power rivalry. And South China Sea conflict will destroy the global economy. This is Blaine in 15. The economic bonds between the U.S., China, and other nations in East and Southeast Asia are immense, and any serious conflicts between them will cripple the global economy. China's dependence on secure trade flows and imports, essential for a burgeoning economy that has been responsible for bringing many millions of Chinese citizens out of poverty, China's export sector has been responsible for the creation of hundreds of millions of jobs. This snapshot of economic and commercial interdependencies highlight the significance of a stable U.S.-China relationship. All parties clearly have a major interest in preventing any one of the various disputes in the South China Sea from escalating militarily. And that causes wars around the world, around the globe to go nuclear. This is Freeman in 14. The global economic order is precarious. Europe is riven by antagonism. Ukraine has become a cockpit of strategic contention. And the United States and Russia have relapsed into hostility. Borders of Africa are being erased. The Indo-Pacific are at daggers. This is the nuclear age. War could end in the annihilation of all. The second advantage is China relations. The U.S. and China are meeting in military to military exchanges, but they are currently tied to political issues. Establishing permanent ones allows them to avoid crisis. This is Kemp Housing and Drone in 16. Cancellation of middle mill activities to demonstrate displeasure with policy decisions by the other side is an approach that outlived its utility. Both are realizing that setting a low bar for suspending engagement serves neither country's interests. A higher standard and a higher standard, no cancellation, is now more generally accepted. Both countries share an interest in defining and delimiting what the new great power relationship, the new great power relationship, and middle mill cooperation locks in overall relations. This is Kemp Housing and Drone in 16. The United States' principal interest in effective U.S.-China mill to mill relations are to avoid conflict, reduce risk, and manage existing and emerging security challenges. Achieving these goals will be a substantive contribution to the broader bilateral relationship. It is imperative that the United States engage in mill to mill activities with China because of how consequential both countries' militaries are. For Washington to do otherwise would be destabilizing in a region and strongly opposed by our friends and adversaries alike. The United States hears Chinese assertions that these acts are constituent elements of a strategy to contain China, but it overall believes that this Chinese perception is belied by more than 35 years. And U.S.-China relations are key to a laundry list of issues, including terrorism. This is Kemp Housing and Drone 16. 
Mill to mill engagement can contribute, contribute to risk reduction and overall bilateral relationship. Improved mill to mill relations support and facilitate broader, broader collaborative efforts in counterterrorism, anti piracy, disaster response and relief, and climate change mitigation. An effective mill to mill relationship can manage tensions over issues on which the two sides do not agree and cannot make concessions. The U.S. has critically, has critically important alliance relationship in the Asia Pacific and cannot be sacrificed for improved U.S. China relations. This reality of conflicting national interests is compounded by misperceptions and unilateral moves that have largely exacerbated existing distrust in the U.S. China relations. Enhanced mail to mail contacts can reduce the risk of miscalculation through the confidence building that declining security tensions might bring. And terrorism causes global nuclear war. This is species six. There is a significant and ever present risk that terrorists could acquire a nuclear device. Terrorist groups could acquire a nuclear weapon by a number of methods, including stealing one from a stockpile of a country or being sold or given one. Very little material is necessary to construct a highly destructive nuclear weapon. The technical barriers to constructing a workable weapon are not significant. The sheer number of methods that can be used to deliver a nuclear device to the United States makes it incredibly likely that terrorists could successfully employ a nuclear weapon. A terrorist attack with a nuclear weapon will be devastating. There will be immense political pressure in the United States to retaliate with nuclear weapons. Thus the plan. The United States should establish guaranteed annual military and military exchanges with the People's Republic of China, demanding that China abandon military expansionism in the South China Seas. Contention 3 is solvency. Constant military engagement is key. The U.S. must let China know that it will never accept maritime expansion. This is Kirkin 15. China is pushing the boundaries of its maritime claims. The slow accumulation of small changes can add up over time a significant strategic change. By building facts on the ground through occupation and declaration of new maritime territory, Beijing builds precedented and physical justification for Chinese claims. The general consensus on both sides was that deteriorating state of China, U.S.-China relations and the need for both governments to have a productive dialogue on their security concerns. This deep and widening channel of distrust is leading to greater potential misunderstanding of lethal miscalculation at a time of crisis. If the U.S. wants to make China a threat, China will become a threat. China can only respond. China's neighbors cannot and have not, and neither can U.S. foreign forces in the region. Current U.S.-China policy of sanguine diplomatic engagement combined with U.S. military capability heading against Chinese defense posture is only increasing tension between the United States and China. This strategy focuses on diplomatic engagement and high-level talks. This ambivalence coincides with increasing numbers of military assets in air and seas around China that might be involved in deadly accidents. Strategy that, however, a strategy that reverses domains of engaging and hedge may foster geopolitical stability and peace. The United States should invert engage and hedge by hedging in a diplomatic realm of bolstering engagement at mill to mill level. This strategic diplomatic intervention with tactical military engagement is a two pronged strategy to unequivocally denounce Beijing and the threat in its actions. I am now open for cross examination. Okay, so my first question is about this piece of blame evidence. It says that the reason that China is expanding into the South China Sea is because of historical disagreements and nationalism that's driving the Chinese government to do so. Sure. What exactly about military to military engagement stops Chinese nationalism or stops China's historical incentives to sure. expand? Uh, the historical reasons why China wants to expand is because China has never been respected on the global uh, level, including now, including now, even where China is a rising economic power, the United States still doesn't contend with it as a global power. That nationalist zeal is to get that respect at a global level. Military to military engagement will resolve those internal concerns because it will force the United States to cooperate rather than sure. engage in hedging. I, I understand China. that respect is important for China. But one of the reasons that they believe that they want to take land in the South China Sea is because they believe that that land belongs to them. Yes. What exactly does respect do to change China's concerns over some land belonging to them? Sure. It's not a question of whether China would change whether that land belongs to them. It's a question of how the disputes over those territories are resolved. We indicate that military-to-military -military engagement would resolve the trends towards miscalculation. Ergo, China would no longer have to uh, counter to U.S. presence, and U the United States wouldn't do the same. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so military-to-military -military engagement, we're already doing that with China right now. Sure. In fact, the RIMPAC exercises just happened. We pledged that we would do those again in 2016. We had done some helicopter landing exercises and humanitarian sure. as well. What about the plan is different from those and changes China's incentives? A lot of reasons. Our Blame, as well as the Kim evidence, indicate that even though we have mill to mill engagement, that those right now are uh, faltering and that we need to revamp those and, over and increase our investment in those types of exchanges. Well, we just said we're going to do more of them in 2016. Sure, helicopter, landing a helicopter 
in China is not the type of military to military engagement that the plan advocates for, right. but rather an increase in stuff like interoperability and intelligence sharing that allows us to resolve miscalculation in the South China Sea. Okay. That uh, doesn't exist at the scale. I'd like scale to talk about the should. second advantage now. So you read this piece of Camp Housen and Thrawn evidence that says US China relations are key to solve terrorism. Uh, the line here just says leads to broader collaborative efforts in counterterrorism, anti piracy, disaster response, and relief. What exactly does the US and China do to stop? terrorist attacks like uh, from ISIS. Sure, uh, well, many things. The United States, that card goes on to talk about how the effectiveness of the United States and China and the Chinese military is one on a, uh, the broadest scale in terms of counter-terror efforts, sharing intelligence, uh, doing about operations intelligence? together. What, in, what intelligence does China have about, about major terrorist groups that we would need from them and wouldn't be able to get from like our European allies? Uh, the Red Plan, obviously I'm not like, uh, privilege to Chinese terror intelligence, but I'm willing to stake this debate on one that China has effective intel gathering capabilities, one that we okay. probably have some interest in. The order is two off, the solvency advantage, the SES advantage, and the mill-to-mill -mill advantage. Of the pivot. The plan is appeasement. 
Giving China unilateral concessions encourages aggression and scares allies, 4 and 12. The CCP has invested political capital in anti-foreign nationalism. These themes demand confrontational foreign postures and effects. A dynamic that is a major factor behind China's recent moves to escalate tensions is Beijing's perception that America is enfeebled, weary of foreign commitments, and in precipitous decline. We no longer appear an attractive teacher or model of modernity, which reduces the benefits of friendly engagement side of the equation. Confrontational sentiments are coming to predominate. Strategic caution is losing ground in Beijing. Third, any perception of change in U.S. commitments for its allied proliferation, Swain in 15. Any movement towards a reduction or significant modification of the U.S. security commitment could result in either moving to acquire nuclear arms and or threats or attacks from North Korea or China. Japan might question Washington's commitment, which could result in a break in the alliance and or Japanese acquisition of nuclear arms. Finally, Asian prolif causes nuclear war, Sambala 15. The possibility of inadvertent nuclear war or escalation was very real during the Cold War. This has carried forward. The spread of nuclear weapons in Asia prevents a complicated mosaic of possibilities. States with variable force structure, operational experience, and command control systems that will be thrown into a matrix of complex political, social, and cultural cross currents contributory to the possibility of war. In Asia, others may seek nuclear weapons if they feel threatened. The present century is unlikely to see nuclear hesitancy that marked the Cold War. Spreading nuclear weapons could profoundly shift the geopolitics of mass destruction. <coughs> Solvency. First, China won't stop salami slicing. The plan doesn't have solve for historical incentives. That was process. Two, the plan doesn't solve. Mill-mill agreements are non-unique and larger structural changes are key. Camphausen and John 16. The agreements on mill-mill CVMs reached during the last two presidential visits are a template for the way ahead. These are really just the first basic steps. Effective mill-mill relations may have only a limited effect on resolving the core political and security concerns. Quality and trading development of diplomatic collaboration and deepening people-to-people -people ties also plays roles. The SCS advantage. First, the South China Sea will remain peaceful. Interdependence and desire to avoid war check escalation, Kim 16. China's rise is not considered to pose a threat to regional security or challenge America's interests. Pragmatic realism would continue to prevail. One cannot assume China will adopt expansionist stance. Cost-benefit analysis makes conflict over ter territory less than desirable and gives China greater incentive to maximize its interests other than through territorial expansion. It is hard to imagine a war scenario bearing the absence of any intense ideological competition as well as interdependence. The chances of Beijing's deliberate conflict are limited. Two, not unique. Tons of mill-to-mill -mill engagement now. That was cross -ex. Three, miscalc is unlikely, Stashwick 15. Evidence does not support the worry that miscalculation may cause a local or tactical incident to spiral out of control. Despite explicit neutral strategic and existential antagonism, none of the hundreds of maritime incidents that occurred over the Cold War escalated. This type of maritime incident is insufficient to lead to the worst case. Four, no impact to economic decline, 2009 proof. Five, data confirmed, Dresdner 14. Analysts asserted that the financial crisis would lead to great power conflict. The aggregate data suggests otherwise. The average level of peacefulness in 2012 is the same as 2007. Interstate violence has declined. Six, economic interdependence checks conflict. Eikenberry 14. China and the U.S. are increasingly interdependent. They are not pitted in a zero-sum geopolitical competition. These circumstances of interdependence create incentives for the two countries to bargain and moderate disputes. The two countries will find powerful reasons not to go down the path of security competition. Seven, non-unique. China has been taking an aggressive stance in the SDS for decades. Eight, conflict unlikely. Tensions won't escalate. They are 13. Milton Mill contact between two countries has gone through repeated cycles of cooperation and suspension. Despite ongoing frictions, the U.S. and China will continue engaging with each other. Both sides understand that mill to mill contacts are a critical component of bilateral engagement. Relations in the SES are more likely to be characterized by cooperation and friction than conflict. The relations advantage. One, doesn't solve terror. Can't resolve anti-Americanism and radicalism, and China isn't key. That's process. Two, they have it backwards. Good relations promote military ties, not the other way around. Kampenhausen and John 16. Consensus among experts that conditions for mill to mill exchanges lie largely in the state of overall bilateral relationships. Any expected progress on the mill-mill front must be preceded by improvements in the broader U.S.-China relationship. There are inherent structural and cultural constraints that must be recognized. Three, 
relations are resilient. Larger cooperative issues like climate change and trade are more important than the South China Sea. Four, major terror attacks are unlikely. Their impact is political hype. Walt 13, we defend the most dangerous types of what's left are best dealt by local authorities. Danger appears modest. Fighting terrorists is a meal ticket and self-interest might incline that they have the hype to the threat. Five, economics makes relations inevitable. Go 14. Beijing has tried to persuade the world that it will not disrupt the existing international order by signing onto international norms. China's reassurance drive has included easing of barriers to trade and investment using the promise of access to the China market to induce policy change. Such policies that combine inducement and persuasion amount to a strategy of pacification, harmony, and enrichment towards neighboring countries. I now stand ready for process. You can go. Yeah. The Mearsheimer evidence that you read on the appeasement this said says that uh, we're engaged in a pivot against China now. What is that pivot to? The Asia pivot strategy means that we're redirecting some of the military force and funding that had previously gone to the Middle East towards Southern Asia and Asia as a whole, which increases the containment strategy of the U.S. Uh, putting more military really? force around really? China. This Mearsheimer evidence says that we're beginning a transition from engagement to containment, which means that to me, it seems to suggest that the current policy towards China is one of engagement, yeah? The Mir China evidence more indicates that since uh, both Obama and Hillary Clinton, as well as Trump's protectionist, protectionist stance, means that we're inevitably transferring to containment now. So Hillary has a protectionist stance? The, the Mir China evidence says that Bill Clinton initially coined the containment strategy in the context of Asia, and that his wife uh, supports it okay. and wants to continue. So Hillary wants to continue. Okay, got it. So let's talk about elections more proper. Uh, this Stanish card you have tagged as Obama's rising popularity and surely Clinton win. What's the warrant for why that's true? The Stanish card indicates that uh, uh, Clinton has Obama backing her. So when people perceive that Obama is being successful, when they like him and his policies, they're more likely to vote for Which Clinton people? because they see like just the American populace would believe that a Clinton presidency is an extension of the Obama presidency. Well, more Spanish specifically... evidence goes on to say that sure. over 50% of adults support Obama, uh, which means that they're happy with the job he's doing and sure. happy with the job that Clinton The warrant in the Spanish evidence is that Obama has the power to unify the base. Hillary has fractured it, especially amongst young people. Which young Democrats will vote for Donald Trump? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, the Glazer evidence... Uh, that you have tagged as uh, people will be upset because like we're soft on China says so that Mitt Romney promised to call China a currency manipulator. Why is that a reason for why Democrats, young Democrats, will vote against Clinton? For the, uh, the Democrats would perpetuate hardline uh, uh, in the status quo would continue to be, have these hardline China policies. However, were we to be seen as going soft on China now, people would believe that Clinton would continue to go soft on China and would thus switch to Trump, who obviously Pretty has a very bombastic and hardline foreign policy stance. Okay, well, how does that, like, why is that true in the context where, on the other day, you said that Obama has had a policy of engaging and not containing China? Again, Obama is shifting to containment and increasing the military containment strategy. Even though Hillary has a stance of being tough on China? Both Obama and Clinton support a containment policy in the status quo, which means it will continue absent the Clinton. Okay, how's everyone doing? Listen up. All right, just going to even go ready order. For order. Yes. I'm going to start on the solvency page. There will be the SCS advantage, which was the first one. The relations advantage, which was the second one. We're going to answer the appeasement DA. And then the elections DA. So the order is the solvency page. Then the South China Sea conflict flow or advantage. Then the relations advantage. Then the appeasement disadvantage. And finally, the elections DA. Does anyone not have that? You need it again? Okay. Solvency. 
SES advantage, relations advantage, the appeasement DA, the elections DA. Good? Cool. On solvency, they say that military to military communication fails, but their evidence is about the status quo. Our cork evidence is phenomenal and indicates that by making China feel more respected and bringing them to the table, we will be able to de-escalate conflicts and institute larger cooperation. Their evidence doesn't speak to increased relationships, which is what the app is about. The SCS advantage. The Kim evidence is pretty bad and says that there's a chance China will be peaceful, but our evidence says that rising tensions make it so even small accidents are likely to cause a war. Military modernization and new Chinese tactics make this uniquely likely, which their evidence doesn't account for. Current military-to-military -military relations are insufficient to solve the AF because people can just cancel on them, but the AF is good enough to overcome those barriers, which I did on the solvency page. The next argument they have is about miscalculation. The stash with evidence is about the Cold War and doesn't assume recent changes in technology or tensions that are happening over low-level skirmishes. Modern warfare means there's a unique incentive to escalate conflict into asymmetric realms, which means miscalculation over nuclear arsenals is more likely because countries feel an incentive to escalate aggressively. Group the next two arguments about economic decline. The first one was just them saying the word 2009 without a warrant, and that recession does not take out our impact because that was a localized domestic decline and doesn't assume the collapse of trade through roots in the South China Sea, which are important to economies global wide. Worldwide, the Freeman evidence is pretty good, maybe, and says that there are conflicts in places around the world that could escalate if the economy declined. So, because their evidence doesn't account for things like Indo-Pak war being a real possibility, war is uniquely likely. Economic interdependence also doesn't solve the app or prevent conflict because we've read offense, which is their case. Then he moves on to the deset, which is offense for the negative. He. Does he answer every argument that the negative made on the case flows? No. So the answer to that is kind of yes and no. He answers, you'll notice he talk, talks about every individual sort of top level claim made by the negative. That obviously doesn't mean that he answers every like line of the block because he doesn't really have time to do that. But he certainly answers each of the distinct arguments that are made by the negative, right? And why does he want to do that? Like, why does he want to cover all of those things? It's the same reason that was just given. The F's offense is their case, right? So if the negative wins one of these like small arguments that take out, say, an impact or take out uniqueness, that's still a major blow for the affirmative, right? So he wants to deal with all those things. He also definitely talks about the dissect quite a lot. Uh, let's see. He extends, I think, more or less all of the 2AC arguments, but that doesn't mean that he spends equal time on all of them. He does some selection in terms of how much time do I want to spend on these, how much of the, you know, sort of line by line like details do I need to do. Um, did he answer the argument that the dissent turns the case? Good. What did he say about that? Or let me start with why is it important that he answered that argument? Um, yeah. Yeah. Good. So he would be if he doesn't ever say anything about the argument that it said turns the case. He, it kind of allows the idea that. The F causes some of its own impacts via the disat, which is never something that the F wants to have happen. <coughs> so why is it that he said this, that the disat does not turn the case? I agree. Um, yeah. Was it, uh, the plan allows meaningful sharing? Yes, good. So he says that because the plan allows a lot of <laughs> like info sharing and meaningful communication between US, the US and China, it can't make miscalculation more likely, right, because it can prevent those things. Excellent. Um, any questions about what is happening on the case or on the dissent? We're now at a point where uh, the choices that remain to be made are the negative is going to choose from its case arguments 
as to what it wants to go for in the two and R. Uh, it doesn't have a choice in terms of the disads because they just have one that's still alive. And the affirmative is eventually going to choose what arguments to extend the 2AR against the disads. So the final rebuttals, rebuttals, rebuttals are about making decisions and deciding what is most important and telling the judge why you want. Um, okay, Lauren? Yeah. Say it again. Is Samba Anjo? Is Samba? Something like that? Is that any like anybody's name? You signed up for two elections and not met a blizzard. Anjo? Is, was that the last name? Yeah. All right. Um, Lucas H. Elijah mm -hmm. H. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Nicholas Clancy. LaHaye Farrell. Mm -hmm. Uh, William Ross, Jackie Rice, and or Connor Goldback. Okay. okay. Yeah, what did, what did you want? Conflicts 
actually escalating, which means that even if they result in less miscalculation with China, there is going to be miscalculation between other East Asian countries, which causes all of their impacts. Only the status quo and maintaining the status quo of containment with China is able to resolve it. Now, the line button. The first argument they make is the uniqueness argument, that the plan is the same as the status quo. The uniqueness of the status quo is Goldilocks. There is no reason that the countries of the countries in East Asia are freaking out right now. They believe that the U.S. has pivot to Asia and the existing containment strategy to Northeast Asia and against China is sufficient. They will not abandon the United States because our current military to military engagement is based upon containing China, not conceding to their claims of sovereignty over the South China Sea. Remember what the one ER said on the case. He said that they would agree with China's salami slicing strategy. That's ridiculous. If you were Japan, you would freak out because that would be conceding ceding to their claims of sovereignty over the South China Sea. That is the definition of appeasement and why the plan is different from the status quo. Second, you should view the link as linear. Even if they win, that there is some perception of appeasement in the status quo, only the plan tips the scales and is viewed as the, uh, the giant transition of the carrot combined with the useless stick that results in other countries proliferating. The plan is the modification of the containment strategy that Japan is afraid of. It sanctions bad actions by China, which is a unique reason that other countries to proliferate. There's a couple of reasons for this. I'm going to jump down to the link debate. The first reason is that the CCP's nationalism is forcing the Chinese to believe that any concessions, i.e. establishing permanent military to military engagement, even if it combined with the demand, is an American weakness strategy. It's the marker of American weakness that is already our losing strategy in the status quo. We need to make America great again, and the only way we can do that is by sticking to the U.S. containment. Second is that allies freak out because the perception of the U.S. Change Changing strategies. That is uniquely key because accommodation is the only reason that other countries would result would, would try to develop nuclear weapons. Because as long as the U.S. maintains the containment that they are that they are doing in the status quo, they would not develop those weapons. Now, the yes proliferation debate. Countries would proliferate. First, is that the U.S. relationship to China is the biggest determinant of the East Asian country's security. Japan and South Korea feel as if their security is okay in the status quo because the U.S. has their back. If they no longer feel like they, we, we do, then they will develop nuclear weapons. And even if they don't, they've conceded the argument that they would develop conventional missiles, which are sufficient to trigger a worldwide conflagration and draw other powers in. That's the one in our black, the, the, the one in our Brzezinski evidence. Second is that there is technology to develop nuclear weapons. They are latent nuclear powers, which means that even if they just have nuclear power plants right now, those are sufficient to be able to establish the technological linkages that bridge the gap between capability and intent that caused Japan and other countries to go nuclear. They have no impact defense to South Korea or Taiwan, specifically getting a nuclear weapon, which is an argument that the one in our made and the one in our conceded. You should err towards the negative because of that. Solvency. Remember the double line. Military to military engagement occurs in the status quo, but is not perceived as appeasement because the exercises are still multilateral. The plan swings the balance too far and results in a year in an annual military to military exercise that does nothing. The only word he gave for what the plan does is awareness. What does awareness do to actually prevent miscalculation? How does that stop a miscalculated incident? By definition, it's an accident. We cannot be aware of when that occurs. They've conceded that salami slicing is inevitable, which means that either one, communications in the status quo are able to resolve it, or two, the plan does nothing to prevent an actual war from breaking out over the South China Sea. You should be highly skeptical of voting on this advantage. The South China Sea advantage. Very swimsuits. Going to the South China Sea. There are no accidents and there's no escalation even if we miscalculate it. I did that on the solvency page, but we have cooperation in the status quo to prevent that. There's no impact to economic decline. I did that on the other I did that in the two NCSA. You shouldn't force me to do it again. Chats. Come on, chats. Relations. <laughs> Seriously, if you can explain to me after the debate what information China has to stop terrorism, you can vote on this, but if not, go. Okay. How are we doing? How are our flows looking? So, listen up please, we're almost done. There's only one more speech. Just gotta stay engaged for a little bit longer. And then you'll get a, a small break, and then you'll be engaged some more. But uh, on the disad, he does a lengthy overview about why the impact of the disad outweighs and turns the app. So those are arguments about why the judge should vote negative because the impact is worse. 
and accesses the app. Goes on to the line by line. It's good that he's leaving the room. If you could do one thing that I would like to complain about, what do you think it is? He does he, he just hated chats for absolutely no No, that is not on the dis ad. And also, I don't care, that's fine. Uh, yes, I heard someone say he jumped around a little bit, so he gave this overview, which was great. Then he answered uh, the first, or, or talked about the first argument that was extended by the 1AR, which is the link uniqueness argument about how uh, current engagement should have triggered the link. Did a bunch of good stuff there. And then he was like, well, I'm already talking about the link, so I might as well go all the way down here to this stuff that is so semi-link turn. And did that, and then jumped back up to this impact defense. I would not emulate that if I were you, only because it can get confusing too easily. Uh, it's good that you all caught that, that is what happened, um, but can be can be a lot to uh, ask the judge to follow in your debates because it's very easy to be like, well, I'm just going to go down and then back up. It's really simple, but it's usually not that simple. Uh, goes on to solvency. Now he spends sort of a decent chunk of time on solvency. Why do you think that this is a good uh, two in our strategy. He doesn't have a ton of time to talk about the like specific case advantage answers, right? The like impact defense, but he does spend a bunch of time on solvency. Why is that useful? Yes. Not you, uh, Solomon. <laughs> Excellent. So it is an app burden to demonstrate that the affirmative solves. If you can win one or two of these arguments about why they don't solve, then that is a major blow or detriment to the app's ability to access their case or their offense. Good. Uh, let's see. Oh, jumping all the way back to the 1AR real quick. You notice that the 1AR didn't talk about the elections to SAD. Does it make sense to everyone why that is? No. Someone said no? Who can explain why it is the 1AR just ignored elections? Yes. Right, so why does the NAG get to make it irrelevant? Uh, yeah. They consider that it has the right to plan, so because of that, like the DA can just essentially be dropped. Yeah, for sure. The, so the argument they conceded specifically like makes it not relevant, but on a larger or like macro scale or level, why does the NAG get to decide that that disad is no longer a thing? Yes. Yeah, good. So the negative introduced an argument, they get to decide that they don't think it's relevant anymore as long as, as Will points out, there's an argument that they can concede that makes it no longer relevant. Does that make sense to everyone? If there was not an argument that they were able to concede, so if the, the affirmative had only read offensive arguments and done what's called straight turning, then that would have made the negative's job a little bit more difficult or at least would have changed things because it would not enable that to have happened. So that, does that make sense to everyone? Uh, I forgot to do that after the 1AR. Okay, back to the 2NR. So spends a bunch of time on solvency. Um, what's the sort of double bind argument that the that Viva keeps making? Where he keeps saying either this or that? What is that argument? Someone who wasn't spoken. Uh, sure. Pulsed economy. What? Uh, it's pretty much a, there's only two options, D and not consume the possibility of other, other options. Oh, sure. So the definition of a double bind? Yes. Okay, but what is the specific argument that Viva is making here? Okay, well. Um, either like China is built to the burden of nationalism and war is inevitable, or um, China sees the South China Sea only as like an economic alternative or something like that, and there's really no incentive for war because they don't have that nationalism. Right, so the Viva is saying I, there are two ways, the two sort of ways of seeing things. And he thinks that both of them are good for the negative. One is that China is super nationalist and driven to by like desire for uh, prestige and control, and thus will strive to maintain control and continue its sovereignty claims no matter what because of that nationalism. Or China is driven by more sort of rational incentives and wants to maintain peace, and thus will not allow a conflict to happen anyway. Make sense to everyone? So that is one thing that Kristen will want to talk about in the 2AR. She will also select from the arguments on the disad to decide which ones, which ways she thinks they're most likely to defeat the disad. So she'll win the case, yes, ideally, she will. and she will <laughs> Not defeat the disad on one or two to three kind of different levels. 
Everyone ready? Yeah. Oh, wait. It's just like people are not signing up for all their elected. Clearly, we did not understand. Say it again. Zoe Lowe. Zoe Lowe. Okay. Uh, William Ross. He bounced, I think. He bounced. Okay. Uh, like out of camp. He just walked out of the room with his stuff. I don't know where he went. Okay. Uh, Lahey Perel. Lahey Perel. Perel. The S. 
a yes page. The only argument here is there will not be an accident. I explained why there would be a bug because we don't have institutionalized cooperation over discussing military strategies, but the act resolves that. On the relations page, I'm not going for the terror impact. We'll just concede that China's not necessary and doesn't have intel, even though Viva messed this up too. I just don't think we need it. The dis <coughs> There's not much I have to answer in the overview because it assumes that they actually get to an impact which means if we win any link or internal link defense, none of this analysis about turns case is relevant. But I do think the case turns the dissent. A couple of reasons. Economic decline makes every conflict worse, and it creates an incentive for nations to lash out and do things like build nuclear weapons, which makes the dissent more likely. But also, even if that's not true, the act that weighs on time frame, which I did above. Now, I'm going to go for a couple of defensive arguments to this dissent, but any single one of them independently is a reason why the dissent doesn't exist. The first is that the plan just is not the thing that matters. To vote for them, you have to come and find me after this debate and explain to me logically why Japan, when we have a nuclear umbrella that protects them, would say, actually, we're going to build nuclear weapons right now because you want to talk to China more, even though you're already doing that. If that doesn't make sense to you, it doesn't make sense to me either, and it's a reason why the link is absolutely nonsensical. We have a security guarantee with them. We do things like cooperate with their military. The fact that we would talk with China obviously does not make them think we are going to abandon the entirety of the Northeast Asian security structure, which is what their link evidence depends on. Barlow re-read this in the 1AR. It literally says that you would have to rearrange Northeast Asia for them to try to get nuclear weapons. The next argument I'm going to go for is just that they can't do it. This defense applies to South Korea and Taiwan too, which is the only other impact they've explained because it relies on a willingness to develop nuclear weapons. None of these countries have nuclear arsenals, and the reason they don't develop them is because it takes so much political will to convince the public that it's worth the economic investment. Even if they could make that investment, it is a 10-year process to take latent material and turn it into a bomb, which means that the very, very worst case, this impact happens 10 years from now, and we'd probably all be dead if the act didn't happen. interactions with one another. She did not feel it was necessary to go for both advantages, so she picked out of one, which gave her more time to talk about the dissent. She picked a couple of arguments on the dissent rather, rather than trying to win all of them. Uh, so, like I said, making choices and indicating why those choices win you to the debate uh, is what these rebuttals are all about. So, um, I would like you, at, at least if you're in my lab, I assume everyone else, we're going to talk about decisions. So. Uh, I'd like you to think about who you think won the debate uh, and write up a couple of lines explaining that. Also keep your flows. Um, what time do you all have? Four. 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 Okay, your lab will start at 4 o'clock. So you have a couple minutes to do that and then get over there. If you need to keep working on your decision, you can take some time. But you should be in your lab by four. 